If you've seen Bo Burnham Inside, you'd probably agree with me when I say I don't think he'd like a video like this being made. I have nothing negative to say about his special, but I unfortunately have something to say. I saw his razor-sharp portrayal of a creator's relationship with content, and I had the great idea to make content about his content. Inside inspires a mix of wonder, despair, frustration, and appreciation. Bo Burnham put together a show of music and light, and his only canvases were his body and the blank walls around him. With only these tools, he gave us insight into the parts of his and our minds that rarely see the light of day. But he created everything, warts and all, with a perfectly timed, bitingly witty, synth-synced light show. Before this special, I had seen probably just a clip or two of Bo Burnham's comedic work, but I thoroughly enjoyed the film Eighth Grade for almost the same reason that I loved Inside. Both films capture real, awkward, and painful experiences wholeheartedly and unabashedly. But beyond Eighth Grade, I didn't quite know who Bo Burnham was, so this was a very interesting introduction to him. Inside depicts a tangible descent Bo undergoes as the film progresses. What started as a comedy begins to feel like a human experiment that shouldn't have passed the ethics check. We see Bo spend several months pacing his room of wires, boxes, and lights, tinkering and creating new versions of himself to be consumed and judged by us, the audience, who populate his disembodied laugh tracks and the scumbag circus that is the internet. He tackles ideas about climate change and social change, and it ends up a devastating self-portrait of a creator looking at himself, the internet, and an apocalypse-bent world through several critical, refracting, but comedic lenses. It's an unrelentingly intimate piece crafted to be consumed by people who might start off strangers, but by the end, we feel as if we were there in the room with him. And for some of us, we keep going back to that room just trying to figure out what it did to us. I understand that by analyzing this desperately personal film that I'll be dissecting themes he had already spent months of time, energy, and pain dissecting himself. But my goal, like with all my screen therapy reviews, is not to talk about the artist and the work alone, but to point our attention back to us, the audience members, and whatever it was that we were feeling when we watched Inside. I've seen the special several times now, and I don't know if this is just unique to those of us who have battled intense anxiety, depression, and or agoraphobia, but I do know I'm not the only one who has somehow adopted this film as an uncomfortable comfort film. I've seen others talk about re-watching it several times or listening to the soundtrack over and over. For us, Burnham captured something that was not only emotionally evocative, but useful. So I won't be approaching his work with a sense of is it good or is it bad. I'll be addressing how it, whether he intended it or not, is healing. Some comedians can easily transition into writing philosophy. Both comedians and philosophers need to look deeply at how the world and people work. They mine for what's interesting, surprising, or funny in the underbelly of a society. They both provide their long-sought and hard-won insights to their audiences. While philosophers usually offer academic and slightly inaccessible insight, sometimes the very talented and somewhat tortured comedian can deliver the same wisdom, but through using their skills as entertainers, they not only make us think, but they make us laugh and cry. Burnham's writing is a perfectly balanced mix of comedy and tragedy, comforting and uncomfortable. He picks at the stitches that kept society together during a global trauma event and dares us to think hard about our hilariously mundane trauma responses and how immobilized or powerless we all feel in the face of spiraling current events. Eventually, he shows us some scary realities about mental health issues and suicidal thoughts through music, humor, rage, and vulnerability. And this is where I tell you how incredibly helpful this is for us as viewers. This is one of the biggest reasons this film has become an uncomfortable comfort film for me. Watching it, I felt vindicated in my fears about the fate of the world, and less alone in how my mind worked or didn't work sometimes. I was allowed to laugh at myself and my anxieties, and then challenged to look at them face to face. I, like many viewers, came out the other side of this film feeling a little bit more in touch with the injured and feral parts of myself. 
What was once too scary to look at or think about for very long became funny, interesting, and yeah, still a little scary, but somehow more worthy of my attention. By challenging us to laugh at some of the ugliest feelings, fears, and frustrations that might have affected us this past year, Bo forces us to sit with and think deeply about what we had wanted to ignore. It takes a great writer with both immense talent and vulnerability to keep an audience's attention on scary or uncomfortable topics while sparking laughter, self-reflection, and maybe a little bit of self-compassion in their audience. During lockdown, the internet was a lifeline for many of us. Social media was where a majority of people spent their time trying to maintain relationships that couldn't be tented in person anymore, or to while away some anxious hours. And some of us would end up doom-scrolling until sick to our stomachs with all the noise and news. Bo Burnham, like all of us, reassessed social media's role in our lives. He made us laugh and ponder the inauthenticity on social media, the ulterior motives of brands and content, and the kind of embarrassing ways we use screens to mediate intimate relationships. In the end, the overall message was mostly a critique of online content. From the branding of social movements to the endless ocean of noise that's being created by content creators like yours truly. The real message I found that was the common thread between all the topics he tackled in almost all of his songs was the crisis of self-presentation. Self-presentation is the act of presenting ourselves online and to others through mediated content that can be posted on social media. Many of his songs and transitions show Bo wrestling with how his self-presentation will be perceived by strangers and how he perceives his own presented self. Through self-presentation, you become a product for others to consume, to love or hate, and while applause can feel wonderful, What's left when the camera isn't rolling, or when the theater is empty, could start to feel smaller and less important. An additional layer is that when a creator in this situation takes their art seriously, they recognize that they, and how they present themselves, are their art. For an artist that uses paint or sculpture, they can judge their brushwork or form to determine if a piece is ready to be debuted. An artist who uses their words and self-presentation as a performer must judge themselves. Throughout each of his pieces is a thread of self-judgment. In his transitions or one-off jokes, you see Bo watching his own work with disdain or nervousness. He never seems quite pleased with his creation or with himself. Even his younger self isn't safe from his or our judgmental eye. All of this frantic and self-dissecting energy we saw from him felt very familiar. Now, this could just be my personal reading of the film. Often, our personal readings of art that is so intimate like this is usually just a self-reflection, which is one of the reasons why such intimate self-portraits like this are so useful for the audience. It helps us know ourselves better. So maybe all I can offer you is a self-portrait of myself based on what his self-portrait showed me. But what I saw in him was an unrelenting, gnawing perfectionism. His songs and spoken pieces are incredibly clever, but fevered. Each song felt like a man trying to keep a boat from sinking. He would put in jokes or lines of subversive self-awareness, covering every angle he could possibly be ridiculed or attacked from. But then he would expertly patch those leaks with a funny jab at himself or the situation. Beyond the humor, I picked up on how scornful he seemed of what he made. I saw a perfectionist trying again and again to accomplish something worthwhile that was never enough a perfectionist that got lost in work for work's sake. And this is where I found comfort, in this dark pit of self-judgment and unrelenting high standards. I got the sense I wasn't so alone. Watching him deteriorate as the film progressed, whether it was acting or real, it doesn't quite matter. It felt real, intimate, and relatable. The ending hit me particularly hard. The song All Eyes On Me is haunting. Of course, we could try to read into the lyrics that it's recreating what he's been told when trying to perform through severe anxiety, 
Or we could talk about how menacing the lyrics are as if he's threatening the audience, which is an interesting overturning of the usual power dynamic where normally he's at the mercy of the audience's power over his life. But in the end, I think his songs are so personal that they might ultimately be indecipherable. There are as many readings as there are people writing reviews. Again, what we see as interesting in art is a reflection of what we personally need from art, which is almost always an insight to help us understand ourselves and our world better. His song Goodbye was particularly tragic. After a year of piecing together this amazing and heartbreaking collection, he's discovered in his burrow, completely exposed, surrounded, and then trapped outside with our prying eyes. He, or his character, was thoroughly sympathetic, naked, afraid, but never alone, always seen, judged, and consumed by others, and worse, by himself, as a forever unfinished product. Everyone will always want more of his presented self, and more laughs, either with him or at him. Even the final shot where he looks unfeelingly at his presented self's terror just before joining in with our laughs, it feels like even he won't completely buy into this portrayal of suffering. After all, he consumes himself and judges himself the most. He's our accomplice, always creating some version of himself for us to chew on. Or maybe I'm overreaching. Who knows? Only he does. However, I'm not sure if he knew that these final images would evoke a real sense of sadness and compassion from us. Many viewers explained how sad, worried, concerned, empathetic they felt watching inside. We see him and we see ourselves in him, our scared, defenseless inner selves. For me at least, inside inadvertently reminded me that I'm not alone in just how jumbled my mind and emotions can get. I'm not alone in my anxiety and existential terror. By feeling worried for Bo and how harsh he was on himself, I felt encouraged to be kinder to myself, to practice self-compassion, to care a little less about my self-presentation, and sadly, to be grateful not to be seen and judged as thoroughly as he is. Now this is where I need to diverge from the original tone of his work. Inside is decidedly not a film about inspiring hope. It's a desperate and despairing film about the inside of one man's apocalyptic thoughts during one of the scariest years in modern history. But the purpose of my writing is always to help us learn what we can from our significant media interactions like this one, even if it sometimes takes a little supplemental perspective. I want to offer you what media psychologists have identified as possible antidotes to some of the worries and fears explored in Inside. It's not much, but I'd like to inject a little hope and resilience into our relationship with this amazing, but devastating film. Staying inside this past year, we might have formed new habits that kept us on our screens longer. In fact, we all probably felt the stress of living what is called permanently online. Even when our screens are off and tucked away, we're thinking about media or opinions on the internet for some of that time. This lack of separation has been known to cause stress not just for us as an audience of content, but those who create content or share their lives online. This stress inducer is usually joined by two others. Information overload is where there is so much information being thrown at us all the time, some of it conflicting or miscommunicated, that we feel stress trying to just stay afloat and knowledgeable. Add that to persistent and hypervigilant social media use, and you also have communication overload, where our thoughts, opinions, reactions, and outrage about the endless stream of information are demanded from us everywhere all the time. At the end of a long day spent on social media without mindfulness, without checking in with ourselves about why we're using social media and when those benefits we were seeking stopped hours ago, we can end up feeling exhausted and burned out from processing so much information and delivering our own reactions only to be reacted to and continuing the cycle of endless information and communication. Although social media use and being permanently online can cause real and profound stress that can definitely add up to long-term negative psychological or emotional effects, it doesn't have to be that way. Through my writings, I try to share what I've learned about digital flourishing and the intentional use of social media for its benefits. Studies show that there is a sweet spot of using social media. 
You can use it just enough with mindfulness, self-awareness, and intentionality so that we can reap the benefits that social media was built to offer. We can manage and maintain relationships with people we know, fortifying our social support network. We can also form new bonds or engage in psychologically beneficial social sharing, where we share with strangers our feelings and reactions to major life events which help us cope through troubling events like a global pandemic and helps us feel connected to humanity in general. Unsurprisingly, that feeling of connectedness is actually considered one of the top psychological resources we need to constantly replenish by spending time with people either in person or virtually. But the key for gaining only the benefits of social media isn't to go cold turkey, but it's to inspect our relationship with it, investigate why we use it, how we use it, and be mindful of the threshold where we stop receiving benefits and start feeling worse by setting our intentions and remaining aware of what we're feeling and thinking while on social media, and only engaging with things that can offer us feelings of authentic connection, then we can start to set up healthy boundaries so that we can only take what we need and disconnect before our returns diminish. For those dealing with perfectionism, there's an unspoken expectation that we're abnormally burdened to do or be more successful or productive in order to earn the privilege of just enjoying life. A perfectionist always lives in the future, rarely enjoying the present moment, but usually promising themselves peace of mind like a carrot on a stick once they reach their next goal, only to of course create more goals before getting there. This leads the perfectionist into cycles of overproductivity, self-criticism, and then burnout. Most destructively, perfectionists work on the assumption that they're uniquely flawed, lazy, or unacceptable. Although psychologists once entertained the idea that high self-esteem, the feeling of being successful or worthy compared to others, was the antidote to perfectionism, what actually ended up being the best treatment was self-compassion. Self-compassion is the ability to understand oneself as being a part of the rest of humanity, equally worthy and equally allowed to rest or to be in pain. Self-compassion is the belief that we're not so strange or alone in our pain and suffering, However, self-compassion is extremely difficult to just practice out of the blue, especially after a lifetime of denying ourselves it, and that's where media comes into play. It's actually much easier to learn how to be compassionate for ourselves while we practice compassion for others. A perfectionist won't feel bad for themselves usually, since they're their harshest critic, but if they see a character very similar to themselves in a movie go through similar struggles, they would be able to feel very compassionate for that character. The trick is to recognize that we need that compassion from ourselves as well. By being invited by Bo to see scary, personal, but relatable feelings that rarely make it into social media or film, we're gifted a sense of belonging and compassion. As we accept the pain, anxiety, and depression that we see in inside, we can learn a little bit about how to accept our own, especially if we become aware of how this projection of compassion works. Bo showed us that our awkward, dark, scary parts of ourselves can be awkward, dark, and scary, but also interesting, funny, haunting, and kind of beautiful. By feeling moved or inspired by him and his work that might touch on our own experiences, we feel a little moved or inspired by ourselves and our experiences. I don't know him, and I don't know much about him beyond this film. But even though I enjoyed Inside so much, a part of me wants to kind of leave him alone after this, to remain one less person looking at him or his work. Whether or not I become a fan, I just truly wish him the best. I've experienced similar all-time lows, complete with derealization, chronic crying, nail-biting perfectionism, and panic attacks. When I was younger, I spent my worst years of anxiety-riddled and depressed agoraphobia growing in my own quiet ways, but it's an amazing feat for someone to have gone through all that pain and come out of it with a masterpiece the way he did. Even more impressive is that he then surrendered this devastating self-portrait to our prying and surgical opinions online, or for his songs to become TikTok memes without any context. Although watching his work took me back to uncomfortable places, I felt strangely brought to peace with those buried parts of my mind that I had been ashamed of. 
What I find a little sad, though, is that while he helped me feel compassion for him and myself, I don't know if he ever found that compassion for himself, if this was all real. And this is one of the rare cases where an artist might have provided viewers with an unintended benefit that they didn't feel for themselves. So I wrote this essay out of a respect and gratitude for what he gifted us and to provide other viewers a little reassurance about their love for this special. I also wanted to give insight into how to avoid some pitfalls in our digital lives and keep hope when wrestling with our injured inner selves. We can move forward doing our best to live lives of digital flourishing and intentional connection with the understanding that we belong to ourselves no matter how we're seen or judged. And my last recommendation is to evaluate what exactly you felt for Bo when watching inside and understand that what you felt for him applies to yourself. If you felt compassion for him, if you wanted rest and comfort for him, please remember to point that compassion and kindness inward as well. If you'd like to see more about media psychology, movies, and video games, please go ahead and subscribe. And if you want to add to the endless information stream that I was talking about, uh, it would mean a lot to me if you could go ahead and share this with others as well, in hopes that it might be helpful. And as always, happy watching.